Welcome to this latest edition of the Real Deal Podcast, episode 774. I'm your host, Scorch of Surreal Joe Queen. We're on this 18th of May, 2021. I'm happy to, be, happy to be here with you as we uh, discuss the world of sports and pop culture. This is going to be a NBA heavy, heavy NBA podcast. So, you know, you want to, you know, it's, I know it's other things going on in the world, uh, in basketball, in the sports world, that is. Um, I, almost, I almost went Kyrie Irving. Well, we can, we can touch. I wasn't even going to touch on that. We, we can touch on that a little bit, uh, maybe. Uh, you know, I think that, that uh, what he said, and that press conference kind of speaks for itself, but we might touch on that. But this is, you know, we... Um, the play-in games begin tonight. Uh, you'll have, of course, Hornets, Pacers, and then Wizards, Celtics. Um, and, of course, the winner of the Wizards, Celtics plays Brooklyn. Uh, will play Brooklyn, which hopefully will be the Wizards because, uh, like, a Celtics-Brooklyn series would be a mercy killing. I mean, that just that series, to me, has nothing. What... Westbrook versus Harden and Durant would be just, I uh, just, I would love to see it. I just, I, would, I mean, absolutely love to see that series. Um, uh, see that series take, take, take place in the first round. Um, listen, you know, the NBA, I, I, you know, you heard a lot of complaints, not a lot of complaints, but you, you heard um, in regards to this play in tournament. In the beginning, when this was first announced, some reservations, especially from the players, a couple of organizations, Dallas Mavericks. This thing to me, up until this point, has been nothing but a success. Um, I have never cared as much as I cared about the last two or three weeks of the regular season as I did uh, this year, as I had in, in past years. Normally around the time, around late March, early April, you cannot wait for the regular season to end and for the playoffs to begin if you are a fan uh, of the NBA. That was not the case. Now, I still can't wait for the playoffs because I'm excited for the playoffs and this this, this feels strange as, it, as, as, you know, as this whole entire year and a half has been with everything that's transpired uh, around the world and, 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 and you know, in, in America and what have you. So I feel strange for the playoffs to be starting, you know, basically February, uh, March, excuse me, May 22nd, which is going to be the first day of the playoffs. Normally, I'd be around the time of, um, you'd be damn near, you'd be damn near uh, ready for the conference finals. But, you know, that last, this last weekend, this past couple of weeks, um, there's something that they, listen, you got to get the NBA, you have to give the NBA credit um, from the standpoint of, ma of making their regular season actually somewhat matter. And that had been a big complaint about the NBA. Well, you know, the games don't really count until the fourth quarter or the games don't really matter until the playoffs. That had been, that had been a recurring narrative around the NBA for, the, for years. That is no longer the case. You really don't want to be playing in this playoff, in, in this playing game. You really want to be amongst the top six seeds moving forward. You know, twist the ankle here. Uh, you know, uh, Steph Curry goes for 60 here. Who knows? Player gets hot. A couple players get, you know, injuries. It, uh, you never know. So now if you're in the seventh, eighth, if you are in the seventh, eighth seed and you lose two games, you don't deserve to make the playoffs, period. You're, you're in that seventh, eighth seed, that seventh, eighth place, a seventh, eighth seed, you only have to win one game. That's it. You only have to win one game. So I think this is here to stay. They might tweak it. I can see they, they might tweak it a little bit to where if you're a seven seed and you all mapped the game, maybe and let have it have it at eighth, eight through ten, or maybe even eight through eleven, possibly. But this is definitely here to stay. Um Hornets Pacers, I'm not really excited about, to be honest with you. Um, 
when Seattle Lamelo Ball fares, you know, this is his first taste of somewhat of a postseason, so it'll be he'll be interesting to watch. Uh, again, Wizards Celtics. I don't know. This is a game that the the Wizards absolutely should win. There is zero excuse for them not to win this game facing a Celtic team that has frankly been one of the more disappointing teams in the entire league and facing a team, a Celtic team that has, a, you know, is going to have a number of question marks in regards to the direction of their organization moving forward. I hear a bunch of excuses being made in regards to, you know, we're looking for this, this, maybe they need a couple of new assistants, maybe they need some new personnel people. Maybe they need a new general manager, a new uh, head of basketball operations. Maybe they need a, maybe they need a new head coach. Just I'm just thinking, just a thought. <laughs> maybe that's the problem. But you know, Stevens and uh, Ainge will be back next year. Um, but they are they those two are the part to me the problems within that in terms of that franchise. And of course, you have Spurs uh, tomorrow. Spurs, Grizzlies, Warriors, Lakers. Spurs, Grizzlies will be competitive. Um, but the Warriors, Lakers, of course, is the marquee matchup. And again, that that's a game where the that's a game tomorrow that absolutely the Lakers should easily win. I know Steph Curry has been the best player in the league for the past two months. He's won back to back player of the month. Will be probably a top three, top five, minimum top five finisher in the MVP ballot and had a phenomenal year. And we'll, we'll talk about that, but I, you look at the rest of that team. <laughs> the rest of that team is just, you know, yeah, Draymond and I know Wiggins has some has some talent there. You know, the Lakers should absolutely handle uh, Golden State tomorrow night. They should absolutely handle them. They've had some, you know, they've gotten in some time, some games under their belt with LeBron. LeBron had a, had a had a good had a had a good had a good weekend. Uh, against Indiana, against New Orleans, against the two teams who have been who are injury, you know, who have been just dominated, ravaged by injuries. Both, you know, Brooklyn and not Brooklyn, both New Orleans and Indiana didn't have any of their main players playing in those two games. But the main thing for the Lakers was to were to get reps. That was the main thing for the, for the Lakers were to get reps. And again, LeBron looked good in both those games. Uh, the Lakers should win that game. Should should take out the Warriors by ten or more points. That should be a double digit. Um, should be a, a double digit outcome. And of course, winner of the Lakers Warriors will play. Uh, the winner of that game will play uh, the Phoenix Suns. So, and which is you know a nightmare for the Suns um, if it's the Lakers, of course, if it's the Lakers. Because you, that that is possibly the worst. That is the worst possible first round matchup the Lakers, that the Phoenix could get is playing the Lakers. The by it is by far the worst possible matchup. Listen, in regards to Ste- Stephen Curry, I never understood what he. First of all, what he did this year was nothing short of just spectacular. He basically almost single-handedly saved the NBA season um, in regards, especially the last couple of months. But it's, but no one, and I mean no one, if you've watched basketball for the last decade or half or, or half decade, should be surprised by what's if you've watched basketball since you know for the last you know close to a decade, should be surprised, or for the last decade, if you're going back to his Davidson days, should be surprised by what Steph Curry did. Stephen Curry is one of the top 20 players of all time. He is, you know, is one of the top, I think, one of the top five players in the league. And he is a guy who was the best player on a team that, that, that won a championship and was the best player on a team that won 73 games. This is who Steph Curry is. And this is who he has been for the last seven, seven to eight years. You know, the, I, the idea, well, questions about can he carry a team? He's been, car- he's been carrying that franchise for the past decade. That franchise, you know, the Golden State was a joke for the better part of 20, for the better part of, uh, fit, of 10 to 15 years before Steph Curry came along. 
Right. Nobody, yeah, they had a couple of good years, you know, the we, the, you know, the we believe team and that, you know, that with the Matt Barnes, Stephen Jackson, um, Baron Davis, they had, yeah, they had a good year, 2007, and then, you know, shocked the world by beating Dallas in the first round. But out, outside of that, that franchise have been a joke for 20 years. So, no, I'm not surprised by, it doesn't even the least bit surprise, surprise me or should surprise anybody that knows anything about basketball in regards to what Stephen Curry was able to do this season. He is a, all, he's a, this guy's an all-time great. And again, I don't know why people don't like Steph Curry. I don't know what, I, I think other players, in the, there are other players in the league that probably are jealous of Steph Curry. I think that um, his so-called failures in the NBA Finals have been just blown completely out of proportion. You go look at his numbers and you go look at how he's performed overall in the NBA Finals. He's been tremendous. He had one, look at he's been in what, five finals. He had one bad finals that 2016, he didn't play well in 2016. Had a bad game seven, did not play well in that finals. He should have been MVP of the 2015 finals, which had, was, has not aged well in regards to Andre Iguodala winning that win the MVP. There's no way Steph Curry should not have been MVP of that series. Going to the winning team. We know LeBron was the best player in that series, but Steph Curry should have won MVP of that series. And he was great um, outside of 2016. He was great in the other finals 17, 18, um, you know, 2019. Took him, got him to the sixth game without Clay Thompson and Kevin Durant. So I, I don't like again. Go look at his cumulative playoff. Number. He's he's one of the top ten playoff players of all time. Period. Yeah, like I, I so again I, I maybe I've been watching a different version of basketball um, than than a lot of people during this the era the Steph Curry era, but um, nothing he did surprised shocked me whatsoever. So surprise me, nothing, nothing, nothing at all. So it should not, it should not have surprised the rest of the world. Um, welcome to the playoffs, New York, Phoenix, and Atlanta. Um, three franchises that have been, to say, bad would be, I guess, an understatement. Those have been three of the worst franchises in the league over the past decade. The Knicks even going back twenty years in Atlanta. No, Atlanta's had some moments. Um, I shouldn't say that about Atlanta because they they have actually had, you know, the Joe Johnson, uh, those teams actually Al Horford, Joe Johnson. They've had, you know, they made the playoffs a couple years. Um, never could, you know, got to the conference finals in 2015. So I guess I shouldn't put Atlanta in the same conversation as New York and Phoenix as far as dormant franchises over the past decade. But uh, those three teams get into the playoffs. Uh, Chris Paul, without question, will probably be second team All NBA, and will be a top five MVP candidate. He should not be the MVP. Let's let's stop with that with that nonsense. He should actually should not be the MVP. It's just, I mean, in terms of production, production just compared to the likes of a Greek Freak or a Jokic or even a Joel, or even a Joel Embiid. So let let's let's calm down. He should be MVP. I'll give you top five MVP finish, which is great. I mean, the league is loaded this year. This is loaded with great players and talented players. So to finish top five in the MVP balancing is nothing to, uh, you know, nothing is, is nothing to kind of brush off. Finish as a top five MVP candidate. But he's been phenomenal this year at, at his advanced age of 36. Uh, Julius Randle, I think you probably should be second team All-NBA. He'll probably be, he's, he's going to make an All-NBA team, but he's been, he's had a great year. Really had a breakout uh, breakout year to say the least. Uh, the Knicks are a four seed. Of course, the Knicks will play. Will take on Atlanta, which should be a, a fun series to watch in the um, uh, in the first round. Um, there, you know, you know this year, and this is where this is one of the highest scoring years um, in recent NBA history, in recent NBA memory. Right? And you see here on the on the on the screen. The highest scoring year since 1970-1971 season teams averaged the average teams averaged 112 points a game. 
Um, this was a offensive dominated year. Uh, we are in the era of offense. You gotta be able to put the biscuit, the, you know, the biscuit in the basket. You have, you cannot play players for the most part. You cannot play players who cannot score uh, for extended periods of time or or in crunch time situations. It's just there's just too much, you know. There's just too much, too many skilled players. There's just too much offense to play players in clutch situations who cannot, who are a liability on offense. You as a player has, to, you have to have a certain a skill offensively that can help your team. Period. You can't, you can't like the, you know, the Andre Robertsons of the world. These these one dimensional guys. These one dimensional like a uh, Tony Allen. Tony, I, I don't think Tony Allen could play in this era. Uh, I don't. I, I don't think he played heavy, heavy minutes, at least heavy minutes in this era. I don't think as great as he was defensively, he was a, a tremendous perimeter defensive player, the best perimeter defensive players of his generation, but he can't score. He can't play four and five in, in, in 2021. Now, it'll be very interesting to watch the playoffs to see the difference between offense in the regular season versus offense in the playoffs, defense in the regular season versus defense in the playoffs. But I still think you have to play a little bit of defense to win a championship. But again, we might be heading into a new era where the, the Brooklyn Nets might totally just destroy that that uh, you know that thought process because they finished they had the highest offensive rating in NBA history this year, and they finished like twenty third in offensive rating and defensive rating. So they might. They might be the aberration, aberration this year in regards to uh, what it takes normally to win a championship uh, from, uh, from a defensive standpoint. Of course, you had the Hall of Fame class of 2020 um, inducted uh, this past weekend. One of the great classes, if not the greatest Hall of Fame classes of all time. Uh, were inducted, and of course, they were led by these three gentlemen. Um, led, you know, headlined, of course, by the late and great Kobe Bryant. Um, it was, you know, I thought, I thought, all, you know, I enjoyed all the speeches. Uh, Dar Garnett, Tim Duncan's, um, Vanessa Bryant, who you who can't give enough credit for having the courage to. You know, kind of relive that trauma. You know, even though she's paying homage to Kobe Bryant, it had to be traumatic for her to be up there as a, another re you know, reminder of, of him not being there. And you know, throughout the whole speech, throughout the whole um, viewing of the Hall of Fame, you just was just I was just wondering, thinking about what would it would have it been like for Kobe to to be there. You know, and, and and to get those flowers uh, from his peers, from all the older legends who were there, Bill Russell's, Magic Johnson's, those guys like that, um, guys that he respected, guys that he, you know, looked up to um, over the course of his career. Uh, so uh, again, I you know, and normally I don't really, I don't, I, I normally don't pay too much attention or a lot of attention to the Hall of Fame class in regards to the weekend or the speeches, maybe it, it depends on who's giving the speech. Of course, we remember, you know, Michael Jordan's speech, Allen Iverson's speech, depending on who's giving the speech, uh, it's how much attention that I, I will give to it. But this definitely had a, 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 a different and had a, a different type of feel to it. Had a, uh, there was a, uh, obviously a, a celebrity, a, a, a kind of, you know, a, a bittersweet, uh, viewing and it, it was a strange energy to kind of be celebrating, you know, celebrating a guy that uh, is no longer with us and a guy that was just, you know, just taken away from us at basically a blink of a, a basically a blink of an eye. And, um, you know, most, you know, the thing about the NBA, yeah, that's in comparison to all other sports, the NBA is not that old. You know, the NBA is only 75 years old a number, there are a number, most of the guys, I would say about 85 to 90% of the guys 
are still living, that are living that, that are in terms of the all-time greats, in terms of the all-stars, Hall of Famers, most of those guys are still living. You know, you talk about uh, Julius Irvings or the Michael Jordans and throughout gen a number of generations. I mean, of course, guys have passed on. Uh, but a lot of the, uh, the majority, I would say the majority of, of, of NBA royalty is still around and still is still living. So that to me, that, that is what separates the NBA to me from, uh, from the other, I think the other, from the other three sports. So it was very eerie to, uh, you know, not again, to not have Kobe there, but I think, I thought the, the ceremonies, I thought everything was done was done well out uh, a couple things in regards to that that could have been different from a clothing standpoint and i, I got i hate the point i hate to, to do this because these are well one of the guys I, one of the guys was my favorite player growing up but i don't know what the hell magic johnson was wearing with the uh the, with the tie the tie situation i mean he had a was a poker, yeah, he had a polka dot, uh, you know, a, a polka dot tie on, like magic. You know, you're worth about seven hundred million dollars. Like, yeah, uh, like, it was like, what was going on with that? And Michael Jordan looked like, you know, the lost heartbeat. <laughs> like, I was like, Michael, come on, Michael, and you're a billionaire, but you know, they, what do I know? Those guys are, you know, wealthy beyond belief. So I guess you get to a certain point where you're making so much money, it doesn't even matter how you dress. I guess it's just like whatever. I can wear, I can just wear the hell I want. But overall, um, I enjoyed the Hall of Fame, um, Hall of Fame weekend. Uh, the, again, and I mentioned this on an IG live that I did. Uh, these guys are all connected at the hip. And these, it, it makes perfect sense that these guys went in together because they all, their careers are so intertwined. Um, again, in, 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 and I'm glad in these uniforms, like as a Kobe's a lifelong, lifelong Laker, Tim Duncan was a lifelong Spur, and Kevin Durant, not Kevin Durant, Kevin Garnett was at his absolute best, the pinnacle of his career for those 12 years that he spent with the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves. We'll talk more about the Hall of Fame class for 2021 uh, later on in the podcast. Certainly a lot to say, about a few things to say about them. Um, now, of course, we don't have all the first round playoff matchups because of the playing games that will take place later on tonight, tomorrow, and also um, Friday as well, on well, Thursday and Friday. Um, but there are some matchups that are set in stone a nightmare first round matchup for the Milwaukee Bucks to get Miami again after not forget let's put aside what happened last year when Miami embarrassed Milwaukee. Um well we can somewhat put aside that but that the way Miami's playing right now we know that team now again make no mistake about it Milwaukee absolutely should win this series. There's no there's no excuse whatsoever. I Milwaukee is a is is a better team than than, than Miami. They had the best player uh, in the series. They should win the series. And Milwaukee is a better team. Miami's not as good as they were last year. Milwaukee, to me, is better than what they were last year. But with all that, with all that being said, of, the, of all the opponents that Milwaukee had a chance to face as a three versus as a three six, this was the worst possible matchup. Um, for them, uh, for them, to, for them. To, for them, when you think about uh, for uh, for them to face uh, in the first round, by far, uh, Miami is a tough team. Miami is a team that they will make Milwaukee bleed to win this series. Jimmy Butler, I've seen Jimmy Butler, first team All NBA on certain on certain ballot, not on certain people's uh, ballots. Um, I, he's going to make an All NBA team. He's been phenomenal. He's had one of the great underappreciated years this year uh, with what he's done. Uh, Hero and Duncan Robinson are starting to get, are starting to put it together after struggling for most of the year. We know we know Bam Adebayo is, is an all-star, very good, and is developing to, uh, you know, he, he could be a superstar in this league. We know what he could do defensively. 
um, and with the rebounding, with the passing. That's this is listen, Milwaukee. If, they, if Milwaukee wants to get to the finals, this is why I think that this they I would not put them in the, in the category or in the conversation with the team that can win a championship. They're going to have to go through Miami, Brooklyn, and Philly. It's just not happening. Like I, I just don't see Milwaukee winning those three series to get to the finals. I just don't see it. But that is a brutal first round series for for them uh, in terms of the matchup. Of course, clip we get a rematch of Clippers versus Dallas. Clippers, of course, should win this series. But I'm telling you right now, Dallas will be a nightmare because Luca, the ver- this version of Luka Doncic is better than last year's version of Luka Doncic. I'm telling you right now, this everybody's going to say this is a five game series. This will be a six or seven game series easily. I'm telling you that right now. I, I still don't trust the Clippers. The Clippers went out their way to avoid the Lakers. It was embarrassing to lose back-to-back games to Houston and Oklahoma City to purposely to sit there, people, uh, Paul George and Kwame and, 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 and uh, Kawhi Leonard. It was embarrassing to watch the Clippers just be scared to death to face the Los Angeles Lakers. Scared to death. And to me, that is not that is not a uh, – that's not what I want to see out of a team that that has championship aspirations. That is not a team that believes that they can win a championship trying to avoid the Lakers. Yeah, if you really believe you can win a championship, you don't care who you play. You don't care who you play. And of course, you'll get a rematch of the 2019 Western Conference semifinals, Denver and Portland. Um Four or five, which is probably, which is, um, want to say, probably a toss up series. Though Jokic is the best player in the series, I probably would lean towards Denver, but I would not be surprised if Portland won that series. So, and of course, we have a potential Brooklyn Washington matchup, which again, sheer entertainment. Brooklyn should, will easy, should easily win the series, but just off the fact that Westbrook. You know, the Westbrook, Durant, Harden dynamic, and the fact that hopefully Bradley Bill is healthy and is is close to being 100% because we know what he can do um, with his ability to uh, score the basketball. And we know Bradley, Bradley Bill, when he's been in the playoffs, has been a big time player. So those are your front, first round matchups to look forward to uh, that kind of stand out. Of course, we. Think I uh, we think it's going to be Lakers, Phoenix, but that of course that's not official. Um, that will be Chris Paul, LeBron James. That will be certainly fun to fun to watch. A bad matchup for Phoenix, but these are the ones right near right here outside of Brooklyn, Washington, that are uh, set in stone. A couple things um, again. Getting back to Steph Curry, um, joined some elite company. Uh, this year, winning his second scoring title, ended up leading the league in scoring at 32 points a game, uh, along with Jordan, Will Chamberlain, and Kareem. He has multiple scoring championships, multiple MVPs, and multiple championships. That is rarefied air. You're talking about Jordan, Will, Kareem. You're talking about only four players have done this, and Jordan and Kareem, of course, have have are the only two players that have had multiple Finals MVPs. On top of that. So they're they're the only players in histories with multiple with with, with uh, multiple scoring titles and championships and Finals MVPs and also regular season MVPs. So they joined even a uh, a, a a more a, a one of more exclusive clubs in NBA history. Kyrie Irving, for all the for all the chatter about about him, a lot of it self induced. He joins a rare club of 50, 40, 90. Only nine players in the history of sport have ever done that. Uh, when he was on the court and when he was playing, he he was great this year. No question about that. And of course, finally, uh, and I, I, guess, I guess I'm late because he mentioned it earlier today, early this morning, 17 straight years of LeBron James averaging 25 points per game. And I, I put, now I had this all set up. I had put this into the podcast before he actually came out and made a statement or not made a statement or put the, put the number on Instagram. 
you know, it's amazing with me Le with LeBron how insecure he is, despite being one of one of the greatest athletes in the history of sports and one of the most influential athletes in the history of sports. I mean, it, it, it's really, it's, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating dynamic with LeBron. LeBron for the most part throughout the course of his career has pushed us to recognize him as this unselfish pass first, make everybody, make everybody better superstar. And that is what's like LeBron's ability to, to be a playmaker passer really is the, is, is the one is the thing, obviously outside of his, outside of, you know, including the, you know, his freakish athleticism, but his playmaking basketball IQ is what separates him from almost everybody has ever, that has ever played this game. Okay. But now he wants us to recognize him as a lethal scorer. Now we haven't, we, he, we've, we've been missing the ball the, all, all these years. We were just giving, because we, we were giving just too much attention to, to the playmaking, to the, the, the chess master that he is as a basketball player, to, his, to the, the basketball IQ. We, that just got too much attention. We didn't give enough attention to his ability to score the basketball. As if someone who has scored 35,000 points, someone who has a top, I want to say top 10 scoring average of all time. He's, let me look at that. He's, somewhere, he's definitely top 10 scoring average of all time. I'll look it up real quick. That's like, to me, that's, it's obvious that LeBron James is one of the great scorers of all time. Look this up real quick. But it's just, you know, like I said, LeBron, it's, it's, I guess it's just a fascinating dynamic of what, uh, of, of, of how much he cares about what people say and think about him. Uh, LeBron is sixth, he's sixth all time in terms of scoring average, uh, with an average of 27 points a game, six all time. And of course, trailing Michael Jordan, Will Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor, Jerry West, and Kevin Durant. He's actually tied with Durant uh, for six all time. They both are at 27 points a game for their careers. And but, but again, the thing the thing that makes LeBron James an icon, an immortal player, the thing that is that taken to the level of that is his ability to be a playmaker to get others involved, his ability, you know, when we've seen LeBron at his best, it hasn't been when he's scoring 35, 36, at 40 points. It's been when he's in that 25 to 30 point range and he's getting the eight to 10 assists and he's getting the seven to 10 rebounds. And he's, you know, when he was, uh, when he was a high level defensive player, he's still very good now, still de pretty good now. But when those Miami days in particular, he was an all NBA defensive player. Again, this, this, is, this, is, this is who and what LeBron is. If we're not talking about him enough, he will say something or do something that puts him back trending or puts him back in the, in our, in, in, that, that puts him back in the middle of all the attention. I just finished speaking of attention. I just finished listening to the Kwame Brown IG live uh, from from um, from a couple of days ago. I think he did it on Sunday, and it really it came out uh, news in terms of all the attention came out yesterday. Um, I had, I really hadn't thought about Kwame Brown in I don't know <clears throat> I don't know how many years. Um, occasionally, his career gets brought up as he gets brought up as being the butt of jokes in regards to you know one of the worst one draft picks of all time and 
what have which is not I, I don't think I'm gonna be honest with you I, I don't think that Kwame Brown is one of the worst number one draft picks of all time I, I don't because I, I don't I didn't come into the league I I didn't I never thought that Kwame Brown was going to be a all-world player or was going to be this can't was this can't miss prospect I never I just didn't think that he was on that level like I didn't think like we knew what LeBron was going to be or had a chance to be Kevin Kevin Garnett uh guys like that who could be Greg or even like like Greg Oden is a bust. That's a bust. Greg Oden's a bust. Anthony Edwards. Um Anthony Bennett, excuse me. Anthony Bennett. That's a bust. I don't think Kwame Brown is a bust. I don't I'd be honest with you. And I think see, so here's a mistake that Kwame Brown made with his retort that was geared towards uh Gilbert Arenas, Matt uh, Gibber Arenas, Matt Barnes, um, Stephen Jackson, and Stephen A. Smith, and guys like that. He went emotional, and once you go emotional, then all the bet, all, then all bets are off. Then like it, it's hard to take you too serious when you get when you get in your feelings. He seemingly was in his feelings, and, and this is seemingly something that had been on that has been on his been on his mind for years, and just something that. that he just finally erupted like a volcano and just do it's like basically enough's enough. But he was making some, he made solid points. And some of the stuff he said was like, look, I bought my mama a house. I played 12 years in this league. I played in a playoff series, you know, against Phoenix where I played well, which he did. I, um, I give back to my community. I'm winning in, in, in really in the game of life. I'm winning. He didn't even mention how much money he made. He's made, you look back in terms of basketball reference. Now, maybe this is with, this is clearly without taxes. He made 63 million, he made $63 million in salary. And he was the first high school player. He was the first number one pick ever to come out of high school. First guy drafted number one ever to come out of high school. So I, I think, you know, if he leaned into that, if he leaned more into to the fact that he, you know, played, had a long NBA career, did some things, did a couple, you know, was a pretty good defensive player and leaned into the fact that he just ended up in a wrong situation, which, which there's no way, like, we know how, and, you know, Finally, Michael Jordan has started getting it right as a, as an owner in terms of you know getting um, uh, getting Lamelo Ball, give him credit for uh, picking up Terry Rozier that the team the team is, has a chance to be in the playoffs. So finally, Michael Jordan may be turned may be turn the corner as a as a uh, as an owner and basketball man. But up to this point, up to this year, he had been awful. We know that that was the worst possible situation for Kwame Brown to go uh, with Michael Jordan, period. It was the worst, probably, you couldn't find a worse possible situation. And who knows if Kwame Brown ends up somewhere else, who knows how his career turns out. So if he leans into that, rather than going back and forth tip for tat or tip for tat with Stephen Jackson and Matt Barnes and give arenas, then I think he would come off, he would come off sounding, uh, he would have came off better. It would have been now, but you know, when you go back and forth, when you in a way of and when it's angry and when it's like emotional, then it's like, you know, then you're basically feeding into what was said about you. Basically showing that what that these things really, really bother you. If you were like, look, man, I'm living my head, living my best life. I don't know why these dudes keep talking about me, but I'm, you know, I'm winning in life. Um, I was the number one pick. Not too many, not too many people in the face of the earth make it to the NBA. I played twelve years in the NBA, so and which is true. Like you know, ninety nine percent of the population will not be will not make it to the NBA. You have a easier time becoming a brain surgeon than making it to the NBA. If he leans into that, then it's like okay, I can I can see totally understand where he's coming from and you start to listen you'll start to listen to some of the, the valid points that he, that he was making but he leaned into the bullshit 
and bringing up things that happened with Steven Jackson and bringing up personal things in regards to Gilbert Arenas, bringing up personal things in regards to uh, mainly Steven Jackson and Gilbert Arenas. He doesn't know, doesn't know Matt Barnes that well. And then it's like, all right, you know, you start, when you go, when you go in that direction, then it's hard, it's hard to take wherever the rest of the stuff you say is serious. And people going, people going to be thinking that you're cloud chasing. People are going to be thinking that you're saying this, not so much to defend yourself, but just to, to, to garner attention. Which I, I, I don't think he was saying this. I, I don't think. I, I think Kwame Brown, like, I think Kwame Brown, I think he got to a point where Kwame Brown was just tired of his uh, of being a, a, a basketball pinata. So I do think that he was just tired of hearing of being disrespected and being tossed aside and kind of being made fun of year in and year out over the course of the last 20 years. That's a long time to get kicked around. And what Stephen Jackson and Matt Barnes said was unnecessary on the podcast in regards to how they, I don't even think what Gilbert Reed said was that bad, to be honest with you. I don't think what Gilbert Reed said was that bad. Was that bad. Uh, matter of fact, Gilbert Reed actually said, hey, he could have been a generational talent, which I don't agree with. And, you know, he had all this, you know, he had all the tools and things. Gilbert Reed had all the tools. Gilbert Reed actually said some decent things about him. I think it was the, you know, I think it was the Stephen Jackson comments that rubbed him the wrong way. And apparently this is not the first time that Stephen Jackson has, has, has brought him up. So I think he kind of his issues were kind of with Stephen Jackson more so than, than anyone. And I just think he's been tired of being the butt of those jokes of one of the worst number one draft picks of all time. Again, Anthony Bennett, guys like Anthony Bennett, guys like uh, there's there have been some guys who not number one picks, but who are lottery picks, top five picks, who are, who have. Who were who were hard, who had way less successful careers than Kwame Brown, who were not even in the league. You remember Corleo Young? Remember him? How about uh, Lenny Cook? You know, uh, you know, Dewan Wagner. But there's something to be to being drafted number one. Like when you're in the, when you're, it's one thing to be considered a bust, but the worst the worst thing you can be. Is viewed as a number one draft pick, the number one, a, a bust, and a number one draft pick. That takes it to a, that takes it that to a whole nother level. And when he says that he's not a bust, I, you know, you know what? When you look at it, he's probably right. Probably, he's probably right. When you look at when you look at the fact that he did play twelve years in the league. But again, I didn't have high expectations for Kwame Brown as a, as a viewer of basketball when he came out. I really did. I did not, like, I, I did not have, I was not high on Kwame Brown at, at all coming out of, uh, of high school, coming out, even now coming out of high school and going to the NBA. Speaking of number ones, uh, it is expected, if it hasn't happened already, that J. Cole's new album, Off Season, will enter Billboard as the number one album in the country. Uh, it is, um, it'll be, it's going to be his sixth number one. Um, listen, if you didn't like KOD, I can understand it. Um, you're going to love, you absolutely have to love this album, though. Um, I, I think it's a phenomenal album. I'm not gonna call it a classic. That 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 term gets tossed around way too much. I I, I do think that it is a slight notch below Four Seal Drives. I think Four Seal Drives, Four Seal Drive is clearly his best album. This I will put a, a very I will put this as a, as a, as a close second. Uh, from start to finish, from product the production, how he used his features. Little uh, you know, Little Baby destroys any feature that he's on. Um, even how he used Cameron. I know a lot of people wanted Cameron to be rapping. No, I was fine with Cameron talking on the first track. I love the album from start to finish. It really, and I, it really is a lesson. 
that you can go away for a couple of years, kind of refresh and come back. Now again, he hadn't officially, he hadn't gone away altogether. Like he was doing some other stuff with Dreamville. He had been on some other some other, some other features and did, did some other individual tracks. But I'm talking in terms of making a studio album. He hadn't made a um, he hadn't made a studio album, you know, uh, by himself since you know KLD, which was 2018, three years ago, which in the world of hip hop is an attorney. Three years, two years is an attorney. But I, I, I respect the fact that, you know, and, and Kendrick, Kendrick Lamar does this as well, has done this as well. He's gonna, when he comes out this year, if he comes out this year, um, it'll be four years since his last studio album, uh, Damn, which came out, well, I think in May, and two, May of 2017. So I think you can come, I, I think that you can go away for a couple of years and, and get, gain some perspective gain some more life experience. And and I don't think you have, like, I, like the thing you respect about J. Cole, Kendrick, Kendrick Lamar, they are, they're not so craving for, they're not craving for attention that they feel like if they're away more than a year or more than six months that people are gonna forget about them. So uh, that, that, that you, that, that aspect of them, I definitely have respect. Again, this is an album that, um, Clear cut is clear cut is clear cut is to the point. Give me a hit, give me a process of what it takes to reach a top level. Give me you his love, uh, his clear love of basketball, his clear love of hip hop. Um, that you know everything that goes behind what it is to be a a great artist or even a great basketball player. So kind of those those worlds kind of collide. Um, of course, he played in the uh, African Basketball League this weekend. Um, so he's living out his dream from that standpoint. He was on the cover of Slam Magazine. I'm um, getting, I, I'm not, listen, I don't, I'm not one of those people who gauge albums by uh in terms of hold albums to a level to where if it's not a classic then it's a bad album uh, i just think that we've gotten to that point to where oh it's, if it's not a classic oh it's, 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 it's some shit. no that's not this is a very very good album better than solid uh, borderline you know it's borderline on great now some of you out there are, are just have you know are too go too crazy because I've heard some people say that this is his best album. This is not his best album. GQ wrote that this is his best album. It's not, this is not better than four two or five. It's not. But it is a is it's a great album regardless. And uh definitely recommend it, recommend to listen. And I'm looking forward to the next um the next one that's gonna come out at the at the end of the uh, at the end of the year. Uh, we wrap up with the Hall of Fame of 2021. We're going to have, finally, Chris Weber, Chris Bosh, Paul Pierce, Ben Wallace to lead uh, the group. Uh, Weber should have been in. <laughs> as soon as, like, five years, Weber should have been first ballot. You know, I forgot what year Weber, Weber actually retired. Uh, I, think, I think Weber retired in 08. Oh, no. But anyway, Weber should have been in, in the Hall of Fame years ago. Uh, it's an absolute joke that he has had to wait this long, but we, we all know that Chris Weber was, you know, it was ranking the power forwards in that generation. He was the third best power, well, fourth best power forward in that generation behind uh, Duncan, Garnett, and Dirt and the Whiskey. Like he was right, he was fourth. And that, that to say that he's fourth is not, that's not an insult. Those three, those three guys are three of the top, probably 15 players in the NBA, three of the top 15, three of the top 20 players in NBA history. Um, you know, Weber, again, gets, gets judged unfairly because he should, Weber had the talent, Weber had the talent to, to be a, on the level of Tim Duncan and Dirty Whiskey, he really did, um, but never quite got to that level. Uh, had, listen, he had a two-year window to win a championship in 02 and 03. And 02, we saw what happened with the Lakers. 
uh, Tim Donaghy, the officiating, and, and, but still they missed 13 free throws in game seven and he did not, you know, did not have a great game seven. And 2003, he got hurt. And that team, I thought 2003, that Sacramento team was the best team in basketball. I thought that was their, that was their window. That, that was their two year window uh, to win a championship. 2004, that the team that started the kind of, they gotten older, they were not, his leaps come off the knee injury. He was not as good as, uh, they were not as good as they had been in the previous, in the previous two years. So that, that, that they lost a tough seven game series to Minnesota um, that year, but they, that, the window was to 0203. That was their two year window to win a championship. Um, but Weber, without the question, without question, Weber should have been a first ballot Hall of Famer. And you look at the numbers that he put up from his second year on up until like for over a decade, he basically was 2010 and four. Um, the playmaking, the passing, uh, sheer athleticism, you know, physicality, he was one of these, an absolute freak of nature. Um, but again, uh, I'm, he gets punished for not being Tim Duncan. He gets punished for not being Dirk and Whiskey. He gets punished for not being Kevin Garnett. It's kind of like Tim, kind of like J. Cole gets punished for not being Kendrick Lamar, which is not fair. It's just not uh, in some ways. Um, but he finally gets in. Bosch, again, should have been the first ballot, but didn't have, certainly didn't have to wait as long. Paul Pierce, we know without question. Long here. Ben Wallace does not. Now, a lot of you are going to try to argue four-time defense player a year, four-time All-Star, um, won a championship with Detroit, uh, all defensive, all league 11 times. He was all, all defensive team, on the all defensive team six times, first team, and was second team all NBA five times, or maybe four, second team all NBA, was all NBA five times. Um, so I believe he was second team four times, third team once. Here, here's what a Hall of Famer is to me. A Hall of Famer is a guy who is a franchise player. A franchise player is a guy who is the best player on a team that is at worst minimum a playoff a playoff team. Okay. Franchise a, a Hall of Famer is a guy who I can put the ball in his hands and say, "Go get me a bucket in a playoff series. Go get me a bucket. Go get me a basket with two minutes left." That is a Hall of Famer. Ben Wallace was a one-dimensional player. He was, he was, he was a hard, he was not, he was the, only, the greatest thing he did offensively was get offensive rebounds and set screens, which was perfect for the Detroit Pistons. You're not building your franchise around Ben Wallace, okay? You're not putting the ball in Ben Wallace's hands in a close playoff game or in a close game in, in November, period. I don't think you can be a one-dimensional Hall of Famer. Now, unless your name is Dennis Rodman, Rodman is the exception because Rodman actually was an underrated passer. I think Rodman is the exception. Outside of Dennis Rodman, and I, and I think right, outside of Dennis Rodman, I don't see a case for for the most part for a for a uh, for a one-dimensional Hall of Famer. And I could say that Dennis Rodman was not one dimensional. That he actually was a was a above average, was an underrated passer. And Rodman would and I and I, I and again anybody who thinks Ben Wallace was as good as defensive player as Dennis Rodman, yeah, you you are you are you're smoking. You are out your mind. He's not. I wouldn't put Ben Wallace on par with Dennis Rodman as a defensive player. He's just not. You watch so too if you determine considering how many different positions that Dennis Rodman could guard. But I don't think Wallace should be in the Hall of Fame. Matter of fact, look back at those 2004 Pistons. None of those guys should be in the Hall of Fame. None of those guys should be in the Hall of Fame. I think Billups is going to get in based on this. I think Billups is definitely going to get in. I don't think Wallace, well, Rashid Wallace, or Rip Hamilton will get in. But I definitely think Billups is going to end up getting in. None, but to me, none of those guys are Hall of Famers. Now, collectively, were they a great team? Absolutely. They both they they complement each other's games perfectly. Unselfish, defensive. Uh, you know, 
did all the little things, all the intangibles. None of those guys are Hall of Famers. That's going to wrap it up for this latest edition of the Real Deal Podcast. I will see you next time. Have a great, great rest of your week. So long.